So welcome back, everybody. When uh, James and I were planning this conference, we really wanted to um, have a theatrical component to it because theater is such an important part of <coughs> Jane Austen's own life and, uh, and plays such an important role in her uh, literature as well. So we approached the graduate students about uh, possibly performing a few of her mini plays that she wrote um, in her teens. And they uh, did far surpassed what we asked them to do. They created their own original play, uh, weaving in elements of different uh, little stories and plays from her juvenilia. I think mostly basing it on love and friendship. And the beautiful Cassandra. And the beautiful Cassandra, of course. Um, and uh, so the, the authors and the people who conceived and adapted this for us are, ten, oh, actually the two gentlemen, Kevin and Adam. Um, we also had uh, the wonderful uh, benefit of costumes from uh, Playmakers Theater. And the, as, as you may know, Professor Jay Betton, who specializes in period costumes, uh, is presenting to us tomorrow. She also uh, volunteered to uh, fit the actual uh, actual costumes that were used in the performances of Pride and Prejudice here, Playmakers. Oh, oh for these people. So our, our cast is in some original uh, costumes. So without further ado, I present Ain't Not My Beautiful Cassandra. Of the 
misfortunes and adventures of your life. But invariably you exclaim, no, never will I comply till I may never again be in danger of experiencing such dreadful ones. Oh, dreadful! <laughs> but surely that, that time is now at hand. You are this day 55. <laughs> if it may ever be said that a woman is in safety from the cruel persecutions of disagreeable lovers, obstinate fathers, surely it must be said at this time of life. So, my dearest, please consider. Your faithful Isabel. misfortunes of my earlier days, yet to avoid the imputation of obstinacy or ill nature, I will gratify the curiosity of your daughter, and may the fortitude with which I have suffered the many afflictions in my past life prove to her a useful lesson in the dangers of the world. <laughs> the world! <laughs> now, my dearest Marianne, as the daughter of my most intimate friend, I think you entitled to the knowledge of my unhappy story and the misfortunes that await young ladies whose sensibilities are perhaps too tremblingly alive. <laughs> now, my father was a native of Ireland and a inhabitant of Wales. My mother was the natural daughter of a Scotch peer by an Italian opera girl. <laughs> I was born in Spain and received my education in a convent in France. <laughs> so my charms are now considerably softened and impaired by the misfortunes I have undergone. I was once beautiful. <laughs> now, however, my only fault, if a fault it can be called, was I had a sensibility too tremblingly alive <laughs> to every affliction of my friends, my acquaintance, and unfortunately, particularly to every affliction of my own. But oh, my accomplishments now even begin to fade. I can neither sing so well nor dance so gracefully as I once did, and I have entirely forgot the minuet della cor. <laughs> but your mother, dear Marianne, had seen the world. She had spent a fortnight in Bath and had slept one night in Southampton. <coughs> Beware, my Laura. She would often say and also. Beware of the insipid vanities and idle dissipations of London, the unmeaning luxuries of Bath, and the stinking fish of Southampton. <laughs> <laughs> but alas, how was I to avoid those evils I should never be exposed to? What probability was there of my ever tasting the dissipations of London or the stinking fish of Southampton? <laughs> ah, how little then did I know that I was so ordained to quit that humble cottage for the deceitful pleasures of the world. Well, at least we're getting to the good stuff. <laughs> but what of me, darling sister? Shall I be deprived of such lovely decadences too? Oh, dearest Cass, never, never, I can help it. <clears throat> oh, noble Cassandra, you are a phoenix. Your taste is refined, your sentiments are noble, and your virtues innumerable. Your talk is rational, and your appearance singular. If the following tale afford one moment's amusement to you, every wish will be gratified of your most obedient and humble servant, moi. Oh, do go on. <laughs> Cassandra was the only daughter of a celebrated milliner in Bond Street. Her father was uh, of noble birth, being the Duchess of Blumpkin's buck. <laughs> <laughs> Cassandra had attained her 15th year, but can't be 16th. Her 16th year, and was lovely and amiable. And alas, I had fallen in love. 
uh, with an amazing font that my mother had made, bespoke to the Countess of Greater Little Pinley. She placed the bonnet on her gentle head and walked from her mother's shop to make her fortune. Now, one evening in December, as my father, my mother, and myself were arranged in social converse round our fireside, we were suddenly greatly astonished by hearing a violent knocking on the outward door of our rustic cot. What sound is that? It sounds to me like a loud rapping at the door. It does indeed, cried I. Mm, I am of the same opinion. It does sound as though someone is exerting uncommon violence against our unoffending door. <laughs> yes, I cannot help thinking it must be somebody who knocks for admittance. That is another point. We must not pretend to know the motives of one who would knock at our door. <laughs> Though that someone does rap at it, I am partly convinced. Shall we admit them? You have no objection, my dear? No, not to be sure. Mm. Oh, hello. Unexpected hospitality. <laughs> so, the noble youth informed us that his name was Lindsay. <clears throat> However, uh, for particular reasons, I shall conceal under the name of Talbot. You see, my father, a mean and mercenary wretch, had been seduced by the false glare of title and fortune, insisting that I marry Lady Dorothea. But no, cried I. <laughs> Although Lady Dorothea is lovely and amiable, and in fact I prefer no woman over her, yet nay, I shall not marry her. Never shall it be said that I married in accordance with my father's wishes. <laughs> and I repeated, nay, never shall it be said I obliged my father. <laughs> my father subsequently, of course, accused me of having read and studied too deeply <clears throat> in novels. <laughs> I did not respond to do so would have been <clears throat> beneath my dignity. <laughs> no, but oh, my Laura, whom I have loved these past four minutes beyond all strength of reason <laughs> or of probability, when will you reward me with yourself? Oh, this very instant, my dear and amiable Edward. <laughs> that worked out rather well. <laughs> 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 United us. For though I had never taken orders, I had been bred for the church. <laughs> Jesus, in his own way, had likewise been bred for the church. <laughs> oh, yes, uh, I do you become a little too silly? Uh, we lose the thread of your narrative. I mean, these people are so frivolous and conceited. Soft cast, a scene of monstrous sensibility. For upon the arrival of Edward and Laura at the family seat of Edward's most particular friend, Augustus, which was but a few miles distant, and on sending in their names, they were immediately admitted to Sophia, the wife of Edward's friend. Now, after having been deprived these three weeks of a friend, a true friend, imagine my transports of beholding one so worthy of the name. Sophia was most elegantly formed. A lovely languor overspread her beautiful features, increasing her beauty. She was all sensibility and feeling. And so we flew into each other's arms. <laughs> and after having exchanged vows of mutual friendship, <laughs> we instantly unfolded to each other the most inward secrets of our hearts. <laughs> by the arrival of Augustus. For never did I see such an affecting scene as the meeting of Edward and Augustus. My life, my soul. Explain the former. My adorable angel. <laughs> as they flew into each other's arms. <laughs> Sir, we have received complaints from your creditors. We scorn to 
reflect a moment on our pecuniary distresses. The very idea of paying our debt. You shall not too much. much. Hmm, that sounds too much like fielding. Exalted <laughs> creatures! Then, you must be hanged. The dawn. Oh, I say, un unhand me, you. What? What is the meaning of this? <laughs> <laughs> hanged it, Don. I must repair immediately to the prison stall of my friend, lament his misfortunes, and hasten his escape. Oh, for a steed of fire. <laughs> I think I spy. 
bought a leg of mutton? Oh, they told me Edward was not dead, but they deceived me. They took him for a cucumber. The night approaches. My wind, my delicate limbs have become weak. I fear I have caught a cold from all of my faintings in the open air. Oh, oh no, I think your cough is turning into a galloping consumption. <laughs> Take a lesson from my unhappy, hate, uh, my unhappy fate. Fainting fits are deadly. Uh, run mad as well as you please, but do not faint. <sighs> Sophia! Ah! <laughs> <clears throat> well, enough about that. Um, I took up my residence in a romantic village in the highlands of Scotland, where I have ever since continued my unceasing lamentations for the death of my husband and my dear friend. Adieu, my dearest Marianne.